recall the question that we're working on, when are two groups equal? Essentially, a group is just a set with a multiplication. So we'd want our groups to have the same cardinality, so they're equal sets, and we would want the multiplications to correspond. So that gives us the definition of an isomorphism. So let's say a mapping pi from g to h, g and h groups. It's called an isomorphism, if and only if. Pi is a bijection, so one went on to. That just means equal as sets. And pi is a homomorphism. So pi of xy equals pi of x, pi of y for all x, y, and g. And this just says if we multiply in g, apply pi, we get the same answer as if we apply pi to x and y and then multiply. So the multiplication factors through pi. Now, if we can find an isomorphism between two groups, G and H, we'll say that G and H are isomorphic and we put in as groups if there are other structures floating around. We write that, G with the congruent sign H. Now, in practice, if I want to show that two groups are isomorphic, well, by the definition, we need to actually construct this pi, this isomorphism. We'll see in some cases that we could skip constructing pi if we can come up with a classification for groups that have certain qualities. So sometimes you can skip constructing pi. Now, as an analog to this business of classification, fed linear algebra, well, if we have two real finite dimensional vector spaces, okay, they're isomorphic as vector spaces if they have the same dimension. So there we skip constructing isomorphism just by checking dimensions. Now, something that's a little bit easier is to see that two groups are not isomorphic. I'll save that for the next video. Now, we need to show one-to-one -one onto and the homomorphism property. So we have a test for the one-to-one -one property. So we'll assume we have pi from g to h is a homomorphism. Pi is one-to-one -one if and only if the kernel of pi is equal to the identity element in g. Again, the analogy from linear algebra. Okay, so if I have a linear transformation, pi is one-to-one -one if and only if the kernel of pi is equal to zero. Okay, and if we're considering the associated matrix, that would mean the null space of that matrix A is equal to zero. Recall, the kernel of pi is the set of all x and g, such that pi of x is equal to the identity element in H. We showed last time the kernel of pi is a normal subgroup in G. Now, for one direction of our statement, we're going to show that kernel of pi equal to the identity element g alone implies that pi is one to one. So for one to one, we want to show whenever we have that pi of x is equal to pi of y, x must be equal to y. So we assume pi of x is equal to pi of y. We'll have that pi of x, y inverse is the identity element in h. So if we cancel a pi of y from both sides, okay, cancel on this side, we get the identity element in H. On the other side, if we put it, say, on the right, we'll have pi of X, pi of Y inverse. By the homomorphism property, I can move the inverse to the inside. And then again, using the homomorphism property, we can collect terms. So we have pi of X, Y inverse. Now note, pi of X, Y inverse is equal to the identity element in H, so X, Y inverse is in the kernel. There's only one element in the kernel, the identity element of G. So X, Y inverse is equal to the identity element of G, or X is equal to Y, so one to one. In the other direction, we show that if pi is one to one, then we have the kernel of pi is equal to the identity element in G. Now, whenever we have a homomorphism from G to H, we have the identity element in G gets carried to the identity element in H. So if we had any other element in the kernel, okay, that would be some x with pi of x equal to 
the identity element H, pi of the identity element G would have to be equal to pi of X. So by the one-to-one -one property, X is equal to the identity element of G. So that's our second assertion. One consequence of our result, G and H are finite. Suppose we have a homomorphism, pi going from G to H. To show that pi is an isomorphism, what do we need? Well, first we would need that the order of G equals the order of H, okay, that's the same number of elements. Then we would want that the kernel of pi is equal to the identity element of G. So that would say one to one, and because of the same number of elements, we would get onto for free. Another useful fact. So let's suppose I have a generating subset S in G. So that just means if we take the subgroup generated by S, okay, so we're going to take all the elements of S, take all their inverses, take all possible products, then we'll get all of G back. If I have a homomorphism, I know the values on S, this generating subset, then I can reconstruct the whole entire homomorphism. Now, for an example, let's take G equal to Z mod 6 under addition. H is going to be the direct product Z mod 2 with Z mod 3 under addition also. We're going to show that these are isomorphic. So I'm going to construct a homomorphism between the two, which is a bijection. So using this idea here, we know that Z mod 6 is cyclic, generated by the element 1. So I'm just going to pick an element to send 1 to. So it's going to be pi of 1 equal to 1 comma 1. Now, we have six elements in here to choose from. We roll out the identity element because we know the identity element has to go to the identity element. So my other choice is, okay, well, if I check the orders, I would want this generator to go to a generator on the other side. So I'd look for another element of order 6 on this side. So my candidates are going to be 1, 1 and 1, 2. So I send it to 1, 1. Now, once I've done that, all the other elements are determined. So for instance, if I have 1 going to 1, 1, then 2 is going to go to 1, 1 plus 1, 1. And in Z2 cross Z3, okay, 2, 2 is just 0, 2. If I want where 3 goes to, take 1, 1, add it to itself three times or I take the value of 2 and add the value for 1. So I would take 0, 2, add 1, 1, and that's going to be 1, 3, or 1, 0, and so on. So this is our map pi. If you note, it's 1 to 1 and on to, so we have a bijection. Then you just have to verify the homomorphism property. So for instance, if I took pi of 1 plus pi of 3, what do we get? Well, that's going to give me 1, 1 plus 1, 0, which is going to give me 2, 1, which is 0, 1. But that should also be equal to pi of 1 plus 3, which is pi of 4, which is 0, 1. So that checks out in that one case. Now, before we get to more examples, we share the following theorem. This theorem is a little bit on the abstract nonsense side, but once we have it, we'll be able to generate many examples easily. Now, theorem, we have pi from g to h, an onto homomorphism, then h is isomorphic to g mod n, where n is the kernel of pi. Okay, we switch here just to keep the notation easy to work with. Now, to show that these are isomorphic, we have to construct an isomorphism. So we'll label that pi tilde from our quotient group to h. I'm going to define pi tilde by pi tilde of the coset gn is equal to pi of g. We have a new feature here. So you'll note there are many ways that we can label this coset. So g of n might be h of n in your preference. So the question is, if we change the label, do we get the same value? So this is the problem of being well-defined. Now, we want to show if the coset Gn equals the coset Hn, 
then pi tilde of gn is equal to pi tilde of hn. If we have that, then it doesn't matter what label we use to name the coset with. So if gn is equal to hn, note we have the identity element in n, so g is in the coset h times n. Or we could write g as h times n, little n, for some little n in the subgroup. Now, we apply pi tilde to the coset gn. By definition, that's pi of g. We have that g is equal to h little n. So we have pi of h little n, which we can write as pi of h, pi of little n. Now, pi of little n, we have that n is in the kernel of pi, so this is going to be the identity element. That gives me pi of h, and by definition, that's going to be equal to pi tilde of the coset hn. So we have well-defined. That leaves us with our usual isomorphism properties now. I have to show we have a homomorphism, one-to-one, -one, and onto. For the homomorphism property, okay, we'll just take two cosets, gn and hn, take their product, apply pi tilde. Now, because we have a normal subgroup, we could just take the obvious product. Okay, so if you work it out, you're just going to switch the h and the n. Then n times n is just n, so we get pi of gh using our definition here. On the other hand, if we take pi tilde applied to gn times pi tilde applied to hn, by definition, we get pi of g times pi of h, and these two are equal by the homomorphism property for pi. So we have a homomorphism. For one to one, by a result from before, I just need to show that the kernel of pi tilde is the identity element. Can okay, recall the identity element here? It's going to be the coset, which is the subgroup n. Now, pi tilde of the coset gn is equal to the identity element h. That means, using the definition, that pi of g is equal to the identity element in h. So that means g is in the kernel of pi. Okay, remember, kernel of pi is what we're calling n. So that means, okay, the element gn, the left coset, is equal to the identity element. So that gives us one to one. Finally, for onto, what we need to show here is if we pick any h in our subgroup h, we're going to be able to find some element, okay, some left coset. When we apply pi tilde to it, we get that h. So we have the pi is on to, so we're going to be able to find some g in our original group g with pi of g equal to h. And then note if we take pi tilde of gn, by definition, that's equal to pi of g and that gets sent to h. So we have on to also. So that's our theorem. Here's an example using a group we haven't seen before. We apply our theorem to the case where g is equal to the real numbers under addition. h is a circle group S1. So S1 for one dimensional sphere. We realize S1 as the unit circle in the complex plane Multiplication is multiplication of complex numbers. And using Euler's formula, we can represent each point in the circle in the form e to the i theta, where theta is between 0 and 2 pi, including 0. So the theta here is just measuring the angle counterclockwise from the positive real axis. Then, if we multiply two points in the unit circle, we're just going to add the angles together. Now, for our homomorphism, we have pi going from the reals to s1. Pi is going to send the real number x to e to the 2 pi i x. So straightforward to see that this is a homomorphism. Then we'll have the kernel of pi is the integers. So by our theorem, that says the quotient group, r modulo z, is isomorphic to the circle group. Now, two ways we can visualize this. On the one hand, I could think of 
we're taking the reels and just wrapping it around the unit circle. And every integer is going to land on the point 1 in the unit circle. So a lot of the picture looks like this if I draw the reels as a spiral. On the other hand, we could think in terms of the partition. So recall, if we have a normal subgroup, that gives us a partition of the group by cosets. Each coset, well, I can choose representatives for each coset in the interval from 0 to 1, including 0, but not the 1. And then what we're doing here is just taking this interval, and we're going to glue the endpoints together to get a circle. Another application of the theorem, proposition, every cyclic group is isomorphic to either the integers under addition or a modular integer group z mod n, where n is greater than or equal to 1. Okay, note if n is equal to 1, we just have a one element group. Now, this gives us a classification scheme for cyclic groups. So all we need to do is know the number of elements if we know it's cyclic. If it has n elements, then it's a z mod n. If it's infinite, then it's isomorphic to the integers. Now, recall, what cyclic means is that every element in our group G can be written as a power of a fixed element little g. So normally, when we do a group generated by elements, we're going to take all the elements, all their inverses, and then take all possible products. Here, we're just taking all powers of g, positive or negative, and g of the 0 is the identity. Now, for our homomorphism, we're going to have pi that sends the integers to g by just sending 1 to the element g, so the generating element. By definition, pi is on 2. Every element can be written as a power of g. See that we have a homomorphism. We just compute. So pi of L plus K is equal to G of L plus K. And we're using addition because we're in the integers. On the outside, we're in the group. So I have pi of L times pi of K, which is G of the L times G of the K, or G of the L plus K. So homomorphism. Now we have two cases. In the first case, we have that the kernel of pi is equal to 0. So that means pi is 1 to 1. We have a one-to-one -one onto map, so that means G is isomorphic to the integers. On the other hand, if the kernel is more than just zero, okay, I'll leave it to you to show that's a subgroup of the form N times Z for some N, say, greater than or equal to one. By our theorem, that says G is isomorphic to Z mod NZ, okay, and that's the same as Z mod N. An immediate consequence, if the order of G is equal to P, a prime, then G is isomorphic to Z mod P under addition. Note, this is an assumption only on the order. We'll get abelian and cyclic for free. So we'll choose any element X not equal to the identity in G. We'll take the subgroup generated by X. We'll call that H. We note the order of H is greater than 1. So it has the identity element and X inside. Now by Lagrange's theorem, the order of H divides the order of G. So the order of H divides P, so it's 1 or P, has more than one element, so it has to be equal to P. That means G is equal to H, and G is generated by the element X. So G is cyclic with P elements. That means G is isomorphic to Z mod P under addition. As a final note, we have a notion of isomorphism class. From set theory, for a given set, that set has a cardinality. This is the collection of all sets that can be put in bijection with our given set. So that's an equivalence class. Note, in this class, there really is only one set. Everything else is in the different ways we can label the points in the set. We have the same idea for groups. So we want to put an equivalence relation on the class of groups. 
We do that using isomorphism. So we say the groups G and H are isomorphic, if and only if there exists an isomorphism pi from G to H. To be an equivalence relation, we need to show reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. For reflexive, we'll show that G is isomorphic to itself. We use the identity map. So we send each element X to itself. It's clearly a bijection and a homomorphism, so reflexive. For symmetric, if G is isomorphic to H, then H is isomorphic to G. Now this one's a little bit of a tongue twister. So let's start. We have an isomorphism, pi going from G to H. Pi is first a bijection. So we can define pi inverse going from H to G. The dictionary here, pi of x is equal to y, if and only if pi inverse of y is equal to x. We know pi inverse is also a bijection. So all we need to show is that pi inverse is a homomorphism. Now, for this, we want to show that pi inverse of xy equals pi inverse of x times pi inverse of y. I'm going to give the two items on the right a name. Say that a is equal to pi inverse of x, b is equal to pi inverse of y. And then I can rewrite these as pi of a equals x and pi of b equals y. If I multiply, then pi of ab is going to be equal to xy using the homomorphism property of pi. So that says pi inverse of xy is equal to ab using our dictionary. Now, a is equal to pi inverse of x, b equals pi inverse of y, and that's our homomorphism property. So symmetric. For transitive, we assume g is isomorphic to h, h is isomorphic to k, then we want to show that g is isomorphic to k. So we assume we have isomorphisms, pi 1 from g to h, pi 2 from h to k, and we can form the composition which will carry us from g to k. Now, the composition of bijections is a bijection, and from last time the composition of homomorphisms is a homomorphism. So the composition of isomorphisms is an isomorphism. That gives us transitive. Now, we have an equivalence relation, so we can form the equivalence classes. If we fix a given G, the equivalence class is going to be the isomorphism class of G. So it's going to be a collection of all groups H such that H is isomorphic to G. Now, note, as with cardinality, what we have here, in a given class, there's only one group. There's just many ways to label the points in the group so that the multiplication is preserved. Now, how would you use such a thing? Well, if we were looking for a classification, this would handle all the double counting. So for instance, in our example from before, z mod 6 and the direct product of z mod 2 and z mod 3 are in the same equivalence class, but it would be cumbersome if every time we had a new group and we had another group that it was isomorphic to, to count that as a separate case.